This is a video about making a poem with a group of students. It's for use in teaching, or you can use it on your own. Um, it's especially about making a poem in a multilingual, multicultural environment. And it's sponsored by the Oxford University Creative Multilingualism Project, which in turn is sponsored by the Open World Research Initiative. It comes from a school with nearly 50 languages, and we've assembled a lovely selection of students here, and they're going to introduce themselves. This school is Oxford Spires Academy. It's a school to the east of the city, and I'm Kate Clanchy. I'm the writer in residence at Oxford Spires, and I've been doing that job for nearly eight years. I'm going to show you an exercise that I've been using for many years with different groups of students, um, and it never fails to stim stimulate creativity and fresh ideas, whether with older or younger students, and whether with new speakers of English or older speakers of English. Um, I call it the Surrealist Game because it's one of a group of games that the Surrealist painters used to use to get themselves going in the morning over their cups of espresso coffee and absinthe, I believe. Um, but it actually works just as well for poetry. And in fact, I was shown it by a poet, by Karen Ann Duffy. The game works by combining concrete nouns and abstract nouns. And it's really important to start with making sure that your group knows that definition because it's one of those things that even if they have been taught it, they will magically forget. So what's a concrete noun? There's lots of ways of defining it. I think the easiest for a concrete noun is to say it's something that you can sense. And it's good to remind yourself of the five senses while you're at it. A concrete noun is a noun that you can feel, or hear, or smell, or taste, or see. So what's an abstract noun? Well, it's not air, but it's something that we can't feel or hear or smell or taste or see. It's an idea. So um, racism or education. Education is an abstract noun. Well, at school, it's a concrete one. It's a feeling hope or love or loss. It's a country sometimes, depending on whether you're actually in the country. We talk about the idea of it. It's a school subject. Everybody knows an abstract noun. Do you know what concrete and abstract nouns are? Have you been through that? Yeah. Ringing, ringing a small bell? Do you know what an abstract noun is? Yeah. Yeah? yeah. Tell me. Is it... I don't know what it is, but I think it's a, a mushroom, like uh, you can smell it and taste it. It's the opposite. Uh, no, no. You can't smell it. You can't smell it. You can't taste it. No, That's like right. You, can, like, you can't see it. You can't. It. You're nearly there. Yeah, go on. It's, it's, it's normally like a feeling like love, hope. It's like an idea. Well, like, what you were saying was a concrete noun. So you do know the concept, but you've got, you got the label the wrong way around. Yeah. A concrete noun isn't made of concrete, but it's one that you can touch and smell. And taste, and taste and hear. So like a desk is concrete. Yeah. Yeah. But an abstract noun is the opposite. So what's that then? Uh, I'll bring it something that is maybe. It's an idea. Okay. So we're sitting in a school room. We're sitting in a school. It's concrete. But what's happening to us is education, and that's abstract. Yeah. You get it. Yeah. Um, if you it, like emotions, feelings. That's what Simon was just saying. They're all abstract. Love. Um, in fact, I think you can, in some extent, a country is an abstract noun. I mean, you know, the, the, the idea of, a na of nationality, Polishness, or Syrianness, or Syrian identity, those are abstractions. But the country itself is concrete because you can touch it. So is air abstract or con concrete? Mm. No, it's concrete because you can feel it, can't you? Oh, yeah. There you go. Feel some concrete air. <laughs> it's not actually concrete, but Excuse that's me, what you it is. You can touch it. Oh, you can, though. You feel it. You can feel it, can't you? You can put like stuff in. Yeah, you do. You can. You can feel it when you move it. You're moving yeah. the air. It's concrete. You, 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 you can feel it. Yeah. You can't feel Something it. that's concrete touches one of your senses. Yeah. Yeah? yeah. And what I think is that a poem happens when an idea touches you. You know when you read something really good, mm. it makes you flush. 
Yeah. 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 Makes you feel. Yeah. So that's what that's what a poem is, and that's what this game is about. You know, do you know your poem about Umi? You, you wrote Muhammad. Umi. Oh, the one about your mother. Yeah. That you wrote in in the Arabic workshop. Yeah. Yeah. That that that, that makes people cry. I show it to people yeah. and they cry. I put it on the um, on Twitter. And um, Don Patterson, who's a very important poet, he said he he said, "Good God." It is a blow to the solar plexus, which means it's like being punched in the stomach. That's good, isn't it? So that was an abstract idea, and he made it concrete. So once everyone knows what their abstract noun is and their uh, concrete noun is, we can start our game. First thing you need to do is to tear your piece of paper into four pieces. And once you've got your four bits of paper, put them in a little pile. First bit of paper Let's choose a concrete noun. So, what they've just eaten for breakfast, <clears throat> things that they can see around the room, how they got there this morning. Bird, tree, bus, pie. All of those are very good concrete nouns. And on the second piece of paper, you need to put the definition of that noun. So if you've written pie, it's a pastry shell containing meat or vegetables. If you've written bird, then it's a feathered creature, mostly with wings. So get the definition. If you, I often say to students, pretend you're the dictionary. Write a really nice definition of that noun. And don't repeat the noun. That's the trick. On your third bit of paper, it's time to think of an abstract noun. So familiar abstract nouns are school subjects history or science, or their feelings, boredom, loss, hope, confusion. Often students want to write love. It's quite often a good idea to say you can't use love for itself. You have to use friendship or loving friendship or lust, frankly. But love in itself can get a little bit anodyne. When everyone's got an abstract noun on the paper, we move on and we use the definition of that noun. It's a little bit more tricky, but it can usually be done. So if you've written hope, it is the condition of looking forward with faith. If you've written grief, then it is the condition of having lost somebody and mourning. There you go. So when you've got all four bits of paper, you do a swap together. Now you do it carefully. You, first of all, you take all the nouns, all the paper, all the pieces of paper with a short word on, and you can pass it to somebody with a loud voice. Nouns. Not definition, not just the abstracts, not just the concretes, just the nouns. And then you pass the definitions, which are the bits of paper with a bit more written on them, to um, someone else in the group, or quite often the teacher, because if you've got a good clear voice and also the capacity to read a student's handwriting, there's more to read of the definitions than there is of the nouns. When you've got your two piles, one pile of definitions, one pile of nouns, you give them a good shuffle. You don't sort them through trying to find out which is abstract and which is concrete. You give them a good shuffle. Because what we're going to do is magically combine these um, abstracts with these concretes, because that's where the poem is. The poem isn't where a poem is never in a list of abstract nouns. And the most common mistake that students make, young students especially, is to want to say something very grand using all the biggest words they've ever been taught. And there's something about that that's, first of all, it's not very particular. It doesn't tell you about them or their experiences. It makes for quite a dull poem. It makes for quite a pompous poem. So this game leads them into thinking of things freshly and reminding them that even the grandest thought often has a kind of a smell or a taste to it. So what you do is you call out the first nouns at the top of the pile, and then you call out the first definition from the top of that pile. Um, they won't match, and that's the good bit. Though one of them might do as you go down through the piles, and it should be a hilarious process. You can, do, uh, you can pick out particularly good ones and make a little list of them. Or you can ask people to write down particularly good images, because that's what they are. They really they create creative images that everyone will enjoy and will start to start people thinking of poems.
So we're going to see if we can find a flower in this room, I'm not a flower, a poem in this room. And Seaman is going to give me a noun and I'm going to give Should the first definition. Say it nice and clearly, yes. Pencil. A pencil is the flower of the feeling of caring. There you go, that's a poem. It's my one. Yeah. Pen. A pen is a tiny creature that resembles a young cat. <laughs> yeah. a nice one. Hope. Hope is a hard, normally wooden plank that opens and closes to separate rooms and give privacy. That's quite Happiness. harsh, actually. Happiness is where you have feelings for someone, but not simple true love, caring for the person. Yeah. That's very nice. Flower. A flower is when you can't take it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> about that one. Love. Smile. Love is the pen writing what you want. Ooh, that's a poem. Yeah. Yeah. Basketball. Basketball is the feeling of caring for someone. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. true. Yeah. Ice cream. Yeah. Ice cream is something we can kick. <laughs> yeah, we don't need ice cream. Hope. Yeah. Hope is a hard ball with a design on it. Love. Yeah, I like that one. Love is very cold and you can eat it. That's good. That's good. That's good. That's good. That's good. Yeah. Hate. Hate is something you want to happen in the future. <laughs> Pen. Pen is the something, the feeling of joy, the condition of feeling joy and happiness. Is that a pen? That's good. A pen. For car, that works. Football. Yeah. Football is to love someone inside your house. <laughs> yeah, right. A door. A door is a thing to write with. <laughs> yep, a kitten. A kitten is love. Oh, no. Ice cream. And ice cream is food. Love. And love is hope. Oh. And help us all. There we are. Oh, hey, we, we, we wrote a poem just like that. Aren't we clever? Yeah. Now, there's lots of different ways of developing this exercise. Um, one way you could simply do is just ask everyone to write a short poem based on one of the ideas that have come from the group. You know, a very short poem, like a haiku, um, a, a line and a half. That's one thing that could be done. Um, you could... You can um, make a group poem together. We could select the best ones and make a group poem. That's another thing we could do. What I did with this group here, and that works quite well, is to ask them to think of an abstract noun that they're interested in. So love, war, racism, Syria. And then they work on giving a concrete definition for it. So what that means is you say, what do the things smell like? What does your idea smell like? What does boredom smell like? Does it smell like burning dust on the overhead projector? What does it taste like? What does it look like? What does it sound like? And if we look at Seaman's poem here, that's what she did. What does war t smell like? Bitter. What does it taste like? Tears. What does it sound like? It sounds like knees falling to the floor. What does it feel like? feels hot and cold, feels like heads aching from crying. And here's Seaman's poem. She finished it very, very quickly. I think she did it in about 10 minutes. Um, and this is what she came up with. War. The bitter, the bitter smell of the air, vicious blood racing down the gutter, red deserting the scene, tears dripping like the rain, blood curdling screams, knees falling to the floor, sadness overwhelming the area, cold and hot, feeling unconscious, heads aching from crying, but cold, the sky grey, its feelings starting to show. It sounded terrible, screaming, banging, swearing, crying, gunshots, wail, like a nightmare, the voice saying, life isn't fair. Now, Seaman has Persian as Farsi as a background language, but she wrote that straight into English. I think you can see a bit of the Persian background coming through in those very big images. They're reminding you that this is somebody that comes from an oral poetry background. Inas took a much more complex route. Um, she's got a lot of Arabic poetry in her background, 
she writes in Arabic, she sometimes writes in English as well. This particular poem she wrote, she listened to it, stimulus in English, she wrote into Arabic, and then she translated back. Uh, but you can still see the exercise coming through. Um, so it went to her first translation, you can see some of the ways that just using her dictionary and her knowledge of English, you can see the Arabic shapes are pushing out through the English. We love this madness and the abundance of rain in the neighbourhood. Love is a mighty genius, always the sky looms. Looms is a very choice word to use there, strange poetic word. Um, and this is the final version as um, as, as written and as fact when she, when she had time to sit down and find the line breaks. Inas's poem that began with this exercise has been through different languages and has been really been refined and turned into an English poem. It's called Love, though it has a still got a strangeness that comes from her creative journey through the Arabic. Love. I love you is the heart of the heart of it, the heart of the ordinary, but the most beautiful too. We love this madness and the abundance of rain in the streets. Love, we know his mighty genius, he does not rest. Always the sky looms and behind the soft rain comes the flood, comes undeniably. So you can see there the different range of responses from an 11 year old to an 18 year old, complexities. The, the simple poem in its own way works as well as the more complex one. Um, you always get a creative answer from this game and it's really worth sitting down and playing it. Just to sum up and remind you of what the game is. Surrealist game is about the union of the concrete and the abstract to create images. Um, the players use four pieces of paper. On the first piece of paper they put a concrete noun. And on the second piece of paper the definition of that noun. On the third piece of paper an abstract noun. And the fourth piece of paper, the definition of that noun, and then they're mixed up. So the nouns go to one player and the definitions to another. And then you play palmalism where you take the first, you shuffle the words, take the first one from the top of your pile. So hope is the thing with feathers that perches in the soul. And that's how you begin to build poems. From those roots, you can build them into different poems in all sorts of different ways. But the good thing to keep remembering to do is to use your five senses to hear, to feel, to smell, to taste, to see. Quite often actually in that order because there's something about seeing that runs over everything else. But so many great images and feelings begin with smell. Good luck. <laughs>